and thank you everyone for joining us today in what is the final session in the year-long series, Race and in America. My name is Richard Locke, and I'm a professor of political science and international and public affairs uh, here at Brown, and I currently uh, serve as the provost. Now, this has been a critically important series that I've been pleased and honored to co-sponsor. And it is especially timely today in the wake of the verdict of the Chauvin trial. While in my view, the jury's findings are certainly a relief, the very fact that much of the nation, myself included, lacked faith that this might be the outcome underscores the work that we need to do and the importance of series like this one uh, to, which is a small part of the effort to educate, to spotlight, to engage in the critical matters uh, that were surfaced uh, during uh, uh, the trial. Now, the credit for the curation of the series goes completely to Professor Tricia Rose and the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America. Uh, and I really wanna thank uh, Tricia and her team at CSREA for all the amazing work that they did uh, this year. And Tricia will be one of the panelists today. Now, about a year ago, in the wake of the chilling incidents of anti-Black racism and police violence throughout the US, including the murder of George Floyd and far too many other people of color, the university took a number of actions to support and amplify work being done on campus that could impact the university and the broader community. Brown has long been committed to addressing racism and discrimination on and beyond campus, but more was needed then and more continues to be needed today. Last summer, we launched a task force focused on addressing anti-Black racism at Brown. We created a seed fund to support relevant research and programming. And we launched this series to bring the expertise of Brown faculty to bear on these complex and deeply rooted issues. We've long had relevant programming on these issues through our various departments, centers, and institutes. But what's been important and I think especially instructive as we reflect on the last year is how valuable it's been to have a regular venue to consider and to work through the issues related to race, racism, social justice, and equity. So by providing a monthly space and highlighting our own faculty expertise, we've been able to investigate the multifaceted and continued impact of racism throughout our society. And while the idea for this particular series emerged from a flashpoint, the series has allowed for deeper inquiry and investigation of salient issues beyond the heat of a single crisis. But our work continues here at Brown, certainly, and for every single one of us, we must, all of us, step up, lean in, and demand and make change. That's the goal of this series. That's our responsibility, everyone on this call. And there's strength in numbers. Today, we have over a thousand people who have registered to participate in this webinar. And I want to thank you all for participating today. And I want to thank all of you who have been participating in the whole year long series. Now, today's panel session is focused on anti black racism. And we're joined by another exceptional panel of faculty. In terms of the format, I will briefly introduce the panelists in the order they will speak and then invite each of them to speak for about 10 minutes. Uh, we will chat out their full biographies uh, in a minute. And at the end of the formal uh, remarks, when all three of the panelists have spoken, I'll begin the Q&A and discussion portion of the program. Now, we've already received a number of really excellent uh, questions uh, from the public, from the audience, but you're able to uh, ask uh, questions using the Q&A function on the Zoom toolbar to pose a question. And I don't know if we can get to all of them, but I uh, promise you we'll do our very best 
uh, to get to as many questions as possible. So let me now turn to introduce our uh, wonderful panelists. And our first two speakers today have only recently joined Brown, and we're very fortunate to have them as a part of our community. Our first speaker is Malik Boykin, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Cognitive, Linguistic, and Psychological Sciences, what we call CLIPS. His research focuses on intergroup relations, hierarchy, prejudice, mentorship, and racial identity. Several of these themes inform his research on attitudes towards historically black colleges and universities and bias in decision-making algorithms. He has affiliate appointments at Brown with both the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America and the Data Sciences Initiative. Our second speaker is Ainsley Lesur. She is an assistant professor in Africana Studies and specializes in political theory with a particular focus on critical theory of race and racism, social justice, democratic theory, black political thought, and feminist theory. Her current book project, tentatively titled Locating Racism in the World Toward an Anti-Racist Reality, reconceptualizes racism in a post-civil rights era. And our third speaker is Trisha Rose. Trisha is the Chancellor's Professor of Africana Studies, Associate Dean of the Faculty for Special Initiatives, and the Director of the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America. Trisha specializes in 20th century African American culture and politics, social thought, popular culture, and gender issues. She is the author of many articles and several books, including Black Noise, Rap Music and Black Culture in Contemporary America, Longing to Tell, Black Women Talk About Sexuality and Intimacy, and most recently, The Hip Hop Wars, what we talk about when we talk about hip hop and why it matters. Thank you, each of you, for agreeing to participate in today's session. Thank you for being incredible colleagues. Thank you, Trisha Rose, to Richard Bach, for inviting me to be a part of this important panel and for birthing this amazing and informative series. And to Marissa, Megan, Hannah, and the CSREA staff, Stephanie, Soraya, Trey, and Caitlin, and many others for helping to make it go. I'm Malik Boykin, uh, a social psychologist by training. And as Rick said, I, I studied the uh, psychology of social hierarchies, as well as prejudice and discrimination, to include ideas related to algorithmic bias and discrimination in higher ed, and even the psychology of negative attitudes towards historically black colleges and universities. I also have the unique distinction of being a second generation Ivy League professor, um, <clears throat> but also the, uh, a, a, a second generation high school student whose guidance counselor told me that I wasn't college material. And this assessment was delivered politely in earnest with a handshake, as if he was saying, uh, as, if he, as if he was saving me from the pressure of having high expectations about brightness in my future. It was delivered with care, a softening of the blow, like he was doing me a favor, a public service, but instead he was teaching me a different lesson about the systemic racism uh, and how it could be delivered by well-meaning liberal-minded people who fail to see intellect or growth potential or even equal humanity when that humanity is enveloped in a black body. Throughout my education journey, I learned other important lessons about anti-black racism from the implied <clears throat> and the structural curriculum from which I continue to gain insights. In second grade, I was kicked out of class for protesting the idea that Christopher Columbus discovered America. I hadn't heard any alternative theory. I just couldn't understand how a land could be discovered if there were people already here. I wondered what do the people who were discovered think of this story I was being told. I didn't realize then that this erasure was deliberate. These indigenous peoples were reduced to objects and obstacles in this white supremacist fiction, as opposed to humans with thoughts, fears, knowledge, culture, feelings, stories, purpose, or rights. And advocating for the legitimacy of their humanity and their perspective got me removed from the classroom. In some ways, as a seven-year-old in classroom discourse, 
I was institutionally reprimanded for the nonviolent protest of injustice, much like Anthony McCollum III and Grant LaFauve were arrested for peacefully protesting the murder of 13-year-old Adam Toledo, killed by police last month in Chicago. A lesson learned for me about the dehumanization of people of color and the consequences of the protest of it, and a foreshadowing of how slavery, colonization, abolition, or civil rights would be engaged in the official record of textbook information that I was caused to regurgitate for evaluation in school. The omission of Black struggle and humanity was part of the curriculum. In fourth grade, my elementary school principal snatched a bag of candy out of my hand in the lunchroom. Candy that I'd purchased that morning. She audited my bag against my receipt because of a phone call she got about a black kid stealing candy from a local store. I was a black kid with candy and she filled in the rest of the gaps with her own imagination and biases. I stole nothing, but I fit the description. I was morally outraged at being essentially criminalized at nine and no apology was ever offered. Another lesson learned. This prepared me for the many indignities I would suffer in adulthood. In 2010, leaving the Library of Congress after copywriting some music, I unknowingly uh, fit the description of someone who allegedly robbed a bank in the area. I was surrounded by police. I was talking to my friend Cliff on the cell phone, a phone I quickly threw when I was surrounded in case it would be mistaken for a pistol. I'd heard enough of those stories. I sincerely thought I was going to be killed, and I was detained by four detained for four hours by DC police and Capitol Police. Uh, Cliff called my brother, a federal attorney, who arrived at the scene to defuse the situation, a privilege that most black men don't have. And at least I was offered an apology that day. The candy incident also helped me uh, prepare for fitting the description of someone who sold a gun at Fort Totten, a public transit train station in DC, uh, near where I live, uh, where, where I grew up where I was told to get face down on the pavement with guns drawn on me while my car was searched. I replayed the traumatic images of Oscar Grant being shot on a subway platform in Oakland in my mind while I laid helpless in a similarly powerless and precarious situation. Thankfully, I survived. Tragic, tragically, Oscar did not. And the ease with which an innocent black man is imagined to be criminal in the minds of officers leaves another painful memory for me and from my father who had to witness much of this episode. I learned to contextualize these events of my life, first through listening to hip hop artists like Chuck D and Karis One, Ice Cube, and not through my formal curriculum at school. A, formula curricul a formal curriculum that taught me in biology how to dissect a frog, but not to deconstruct biological racism. And as such, black death is overrepresented on the news, but underrepresented in history books. And where erasure of br the brutality of slavery serves the avoidance motivations that support anti-Black racism. Textbooks where the murder by mob of Black people, including war veterans and soldiers during the Great Migration, were omitted. The Great Migration, where my great-grandfather, Ulysses S. Boykin, who served during the Spanish insurrection in the Philippines, was tipped off that he'd be murdered by mob on the next day in Tennessee and fled that existential threat overnight to Michigan leaving behind family and everything he owned to be a racial refugee in the North. And here I'm reminded of Charles Lewis, who in, in 1918 was in uniform and was accused of being a robbery suspect and protested that he was a soldier. He was subsequently arrested for assault. The next morning, a group of white men broke into the jail, found Mr. Lewis and hung him. Stories like these give humanity to the decisions of Second Lieutenant Caron Nazario who was pulled over by an officer on a dark road in Virginia, a place where Caron did not feel safe alone with an officer as he was suspicious that he might experience anti-Black racism. He drove to a well-lit gas station to then comply with the officer's demands where at least some record of events might be recorded to maybe support the potential of accountability. He was pepper sprayed as his life was threatened by the officer. You're fixing to ride the lightning, son. Son, it seems maybe Mr. Nazario's suspicions were correct. These points and patterns are admitted from the curriculum, delegitimized with rhetoric and avoided psychologically. And that fact, <clears throat> someone may feel, uh, and the fact that someone may feel indifferently about their chances of surviving a police encounter because of their race is not offered any care or humanity by many. It's just met with the anger of insubordination, 
uh, when black when a black person isn't acting exactly as an officer who may deny the legitimacy of their fears or their humanity commands them to. These omissions are choices about what is important, a prioritization of stories, a hierarchy of information that is a footprint of an implied hierarchy of people in American society and globally, a hierarchy where black history and stories are systematically omitted from the curriculum. So then in a moment like this, the day after the verdict of a trial about which the discourse and rhetoric surrounding the murder of George Floyd Jr. by Officer Derek Chauvin parallels the discourse surrounding the murder of James Byrd Jr. in 1989 by Sean Barry, Lawrence Brewer, and John King, the three men who were convicted and sentenced for his murder, an often forgotten grisly episode where a man was chained to the back of a truck and dragged to death, a story that lays buried in American history, an episode we could have learned from, but in large part, as a society, have chosen not to. And so that on a day like to this, uh, on a day like today, where many of, our, many of us celebrate the fact that a murder that everyone saw was actually convicted, the injustice is that the result itself is a surprising relief. And this is only because anti-Black racism in America has meant that injustices involving humans enveloped in Black bodies are normative and are expected. Well, at least that's a lot of what I learned in school. Thank you. That was, uh, that was ex really excellent and very, very powerful. Uh, lots, uh, lots to think about. Uh, let's now turn to uh, Angeli Lasour. Angeli. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you to Trisha Rose um, and Richard Locke for inviting me to participate on this panel. And thank you to all the people in the provost's office and the CR CSREA for making this series possible. I'll just jump in. So Black people are human beings, but anti-Blackness allows beings to relate to Black beings as if they are actually Black things. Franz Fanon, a Martinican psychoanalyst and anti-colonial political theorist writing in the 1950s and 60s, opens the fifth chapter of Black Skin, White Mask, which has been translated as, quote, the lived experience of the Black or the lived experience of the Black man with the following, quote, I came into this world anxious to uncover the meaning of things, my soul desirous to be at the origin of the world, and here I am, an object among other objects. Fanon's realization, this dawning really, that he is an object rather than a being, is traumatic, in part because it isn't true. To be related to as if he were an object deprives Fanon, a Black being, of his birthright, the significance of his ability to uncover the meaning of things in the world. Anti-Blackness then is a fundamental violation of reality that deprives Black beings of their birthright, the world-making significance of their perceptual meaning-making capacity. The first chapter, the fifth chapter of Black Skin, White Mask is particularly illuminating about how anti-Blackness is able to commit and sustain this violation across time and space. Fanon illuminates the violation of anti-Blackness by depicting his experience of an encounter he has with a little white boy on a train in France. Fanon writes, quote, look, a Negro, it was a passing sting. I attempted a smile. Look, a Negro, the circle was gradually getting smaller. I was really enjoying myself. Mama, look, a Negro, I'm scared. At this point in the encounter, Fanon loses it privately within his person. He experiences himself in multiple places at once on a train. He hears things that are not exactly sounds like cannibalism, backwardness, and fetishism. And ultimately, he reports taking himself far, very far from himself and giving himself up as an object. The results of which occasion, quote, an amputation, an excision, a hemorrhage that spattered his whole body with black blood, end quote. Fanon depicts vivid, disturbing sensorial experiences, but they are not real. And though the white boy's call triggers Fanon's disorienting experience, it is what Fanon says he knows, the quote, legend, stories, history, end quote, that triggers an attack of his body schema. Ultimately, Fanon's encounter with the little white boy causes his body schema to disintegrate and Fanon's perception gives way to a hallucination. Scholars have long noted that the title of the fifth chapter, The Lived Experience of the Black, and Fanon's talk of the body schema signal Fanon's engagement with Merleau-Ponty, a popular phenomenological thinker in France during the time Fanon wrote Black Skin, White Mask. And still, 
acknowledging that the scene Fanon describes on the train is a description of his experience as blackness, which causes him to suffer from hallucination, lays bare a great big puzzle. Why is Fanon hallucinating? And the immensity of this puzzle comes to light once we realize that the scene Fanon has staged in the opening pages of the fifth chapter of Black Skin, White Mask mark a substantive engagement with Merleau-Ponty's understanding of what hallucination reveals to us about our perceptual powers, our phenomenal bodies, and the world we share in common. But Fanon's hallucination is not like typical hallucinations. Fanon makes this much clearer when prior to depicting the disintegration of his body schema, Fanon locates himself in the world as a person who can successfully accomplish a mundane task like smoking a cigarette. Fanon writes, quote, I know that if I want to smoke, I shall have to stretch out my right arm and grab the pack of cigarettes lying at the other end of the table. As for the matches, they are in the left drawer and I shall have to move back a little, end quote. What one must do to smoke a cigarette, Fanon explains, is more than just smoking a cigarette. It is also a, quote, definitive structuring of myself and the world, definitive because it creates a genuine dialectic between my body and the world, end quote. This cigarette example showcases two significant relationships that are central for understanding how anti-Black racism divests Black folk of their birthright, the world-making significance of their perceptual meaning-making capacities. The first relationship on display is Fanon's relationship to actual things in the world. And the other relationship on display is Fanon's relationship to others. Let's start with the first. What, what Fanon must know to grab the cigarettes and matches is demonstrative of the knowledge his body carries that enables him to move through space effectively. This knowledge is exhibited through the perceptual capacities of the body, which is in constant relationship with an environment that enables a twin operation. On the one hand, the body projects the world that arranges about us the setting that we share with others. On the other hand, the body also establishes an individual landscape, an artifact of the way the outside world impinges upon us and by means of which we are in vital communication with that world. In the phenomenology of perception, Merleau-Ponty challenges conceptions of hallucination that reduce them to mere judgments, interpretations or beliefs that depart from hearing and seeing in the genuine sense of these words. With a return to the experience of a hallucination, one finds that he is able to classify the voice or vision of an interlocutor as a hallucination because he cannot find anything similar in his visual or auditory world. One is aware of, quote, apprehending through hearing and sight, a system of phenomena which make up not only a private spectacle, but the only possible one for me and even for others, end quote. The only thing then on Merleau-Ponty's account that distinguishes the perception of one who hallucinates from the perception of one who does not is the hallucination singular grounding in the individual personal, indiv individual's personal landscape. Merleau-Ponty writes, quote, the normal person does not find satisfaction in subjectivity. He runs away from it. He is genuinely concerned with being in the world and his hold on time is direct and unreflecting. Whereas the sufferer from hallucination simply exploits his being in the world in order to carve a private sector for himself out of the common property world, end quote. On Merleau-Ponty's account, Fanon should not be hallucinating. Fanon's openness to the world should be the anecdote to the threat of illusion that stalks every perceiver. Yet Fanon says his openness to the world is responsible for his hallucination. If Fanon is normal, that is open to the world and not idiosyncratically exploiting his individual landscape in order, quote, to carve a private section for himself out of the common property world, end quote, then how do we explain the occurrence of Fanon's hallucination? We can explain Fanon's hallucination by exploring the second significant relationship the cigarette example showcases. Fanon's place within the cultural world. So on Merleau-Ponty's account, though, quote, the natural world is the horizon of all horizons, the style of all possible styles, which guarantees for my experiences a given not willed unity, end quote. He adds that, quote, behavior patterns settle into that nature and are deposited in the form of a cultural world, end quote. So in a sense, the cultural world sits atop the natural world. And like the natural world, the cultural world also finds its way into the core of our personal lives. However, while the body is unmistakably distinct from natural things in the natural world, the body is also encountered as a cultural object first in the cultural world, because one's conscious life, that is one's thoughts, intentions, and projects is perceived by others, 
quote, in the shape of a body and in the environment which one builds for himself, end quote. When Fanon reaches for the cigarette on the table and leans back for the matches in the left drawer, Fanon's consciousness, his project, and his intention are on display in the form of a body. In this role, the body is the most fundamental cultural object of the cultural world. Fanon's depiction of himself smoking a cigarette is also a depiction of his necessary role, role as a cultural object in the disclosure and making of a cultural world. As Fanon writes, quote, a slow construction of myself as a body in a spatial and temporal world, such seems to be the schema, end quote. What is at stake, however, is the perception of Fanon as a cultural object, as a vehicle of a form of behavior that is also acknowledged and understood to be a fellow being like the other being who perceives him as such. Specifically, Fanon's novel insight in chapter five is that in the same way that the psychotic can exploit the individual landscape derived from the world he carries within himself, disconnecting from the objective world that supplies his personal holding in order to overlay reality with a hallucination that takes on the value of reality. People in an anti-Black world can exploit the re precondition of any reciprocal relationship with a fellow being, that being's appearance in a shared world as a cultural object by building up a cultural world that relates to Black people as if they were objects. What is shared in a world like this is not only sensory content like cigarettes on the table, but also a mythological European fabrication that takes on a value of reality because a white cultural world, a product of patterns of behavior, or as Fanon puts it, European customs and agencies has been produced that sits atop the objective natural world. This cultural world violates the being and reality of black bodies in service of a quasi reality of white supremacy it manufactures. Now this reading of Fanon's work that I offer you today illuminates the problem of anti-black racism, but also indicates some promising features of the world we share together that could help us out of this bind too. The stubborn persistence of reality, even, one, even when one is subsumed by hallucination is one of those things that accompanies the world-making significance of our meaning-making capacities that could get us out. And also the fact that what we do, how we perceive is um, significant in our making of the world. So these two things I think can begin to anchor us and help us think of a way out, but that's all the time I have for today. Um, and perhaps we can talk about this more during Q and A, thank you. Thank you, Ainsley. That was that was really terrific, and and certainly we'll come back and uh, and and revisit the pathways uh, for um, coming out of the current dilemma. Thank you all so very much for joining us today. Today's event in the race and in America series is the capstone event in a remarkable set of conversations and reflections that have been taken up over the past academic year. It's been wholeheartedly supported by Provost Rick Locke and ably and generously facilitated by the Provost's Chief of Staff, Marissa Quinn, and Megan Silvestri from Event Services, and made possible by what I think are the unsung heroes of this past 14 months, media services. I don't think we would have survived without them. The CSREA staff are extraordinary and they make everything I do and think I'm going to do possible, and so I'm always grateful. I want to quickly make a note that CSREA is going to be holding a teach-in on the Chauvin trial and the question of what's next and how to think about this outcome uh, tomorrow, April 22nd at 5 p.m. The link for this event for registration will be in the chat, so take a look. If you're interested, please join us, and it will also be available at the CSREA website at Brown. The Race and in America series would have been entirely impossible without the brilliance and generosity of so many colleagues from an amazing array of disciplines this past year. For those of you who've participated and come to the audience and asked great questions, you know how amazing our Brown faculty are. So I wanna extend my deep gratitude to my extraordinary colleagues and friends here at Brown, their willingness to be a part of this, to say yes, count me in, heartily and immediately while under the relentless stress of this past year means the world to me. 
the vision driving the series in which we tackled race and slavery, race and social movements and representation and uh, genetics and policing and so on, provided an opportunity for everyone to think and to hear and to listen broadly. And despite this broad topical engagement and the insightful comments everyone prepared, we ended up barely scratching the surface of even the areas that we attended to and therefore uh, only got a chance to examine some of the legacies and ongoing practices of systemic racism, as well as the really amazing forms of resistance through social movement, various forms of alternative representation and creative expression, as well as democratic practice. At the same time, we fashioned this set of conversations to examine the issue of anti-Black racism as it takes place across time and many areas because anti-Black racism saturates the environment and defines our social reality across nearly all facets of American life. And so I wasn't so much interested only in showcasing Brown's brilliance in our faculty across various areas, um, but what I really wanted to, uh, to focus on was one of the key intentions of the series, which was to encourage participants to wonder where race and anti-Black racism isn't playing a critical role in American society. Month after month, listening to experts in every discipline reveal the workings of race, I hoped would make visible the extraordinary and foundational role of anti-Black racism in American society today. This wasn't an idle intention, and it was not based on an assumption of a mere lack of education about race. It was directed at unsettling the underlying mainstream approach to thinking about anti-Black racism in our country, which relies on what I'm calling the illusion of racism as an exception. The resilience of anti-Black racism is largely fueled by this illusion. A great deal of our time is spent identifying and addressing and fretting over a highly publicized extreme act around which our efforts and our understanding of anti-Black racism eventually galvanize. The focus on this extreme moment is a form of exceptionalism. It connects our thinking about systemic racism to shocking violence and gives us something about which we think we can agree, something that implies that we are all against systemic racism. Relying on such highly visible violent acts and moments as the grounds on which we unite ultimately works to normalize the structures in place all around us. Structures where the violence and oppression is not one man's knee, the suffocation that is not easily capturable in video form, and instead is a constant barrage that we need far more than nine minutes to reveal. I don't mean to discourage or disparage the extraordinary outpouring of activism and protest that has been a profoundly inspiring element of a decidedly uninspiring 2020. The swelled ranks of multiracial, multigenerational protests were not simply in response to the video of, of Chauvin's treatment of George Floyd. It was a result of a long, hard organizing and activism uh, led mainly by Black Lives Matter organizers across the world. They set the stage for turning the tide in public opinion. Movements on the ground have to find places that will give way. And this moment represented a crack in the rock. And yet building racial solidarity on a vicious example of depraved indifference to black life can easily work against the goal and purpose of shedding light on the workings of anti-black racism as a system in the first place. For many people who come to racial justice work, or more specifically, those who come to awareness about racism itself through the activism around the murder of George Floyd, this incident serves as a catalyst for action because it is itself beyond the pale. The focus on the most extreme documented act of depravity of the moment creates a feeling of general unity, although not completely, Note the marked silence of Republican politicians, even in this extreme case. Chauvin, for those of us who feel this general unity, gives us something upon which we can agree. That was evil, and we in here must stand against it. 
This moment is the exception on which we can all agree, the exception that obscures the rule. So the timing of this final panel discussion on race and anti-Black racism couldn't be more timely, and yet I wanna argue it couldn't be more distracting. Late yesterday afternoon, the jury returned three guilty verdicts in the case of Chauvin, more, more, most importantly of which was a guilty verdict for second degree murder. But this conviction is rare. Data from Philip Matthew Stinton, a criminal justice expert, reports that over the past 15 years, there have been an average of 1,000 fatal shootings by police each year for which police officers are arrested between 1% and 2% of the time. So of the 15,000 or so fatal shootings since 2005, 139 officers have been arrested for murder or manslaughter. And of these 139, 44 have been convicted, many on lesser charges, and only seven have been convicted of murder. Some advocates of criminal justice reform have argued that prosecuting officers may even be counterproductive because it avoids addressing systemic problems like the ones that I'm gonna to turn to in a moment and allows the mainstream white public and the politicians who represent them to rest easy, believing that problems, problem police officers have gotten their due. Quite the opposite. Uh, an extensive body of research has shown that the police have been a long-standing institution that served to maintain racial segregation, fuel the myriad forms of resource extraction from black communities, and punish the poor while creating peaceful, safe, and extraordinary privilege for middle-class and wealthy whites. New York's stop and frisk policy, which was deployed in many other cities as well, and eventually deemed unconstitutional, harassed and traumatized an entire generation. An estimated 4.43 million stops were conducted in New York alone between 2004 and 2012. About 83% of these stops involved Black or Latinx young people, even though they made up barely 50% of the city's population. Only 8% of the people frisked or searched by NYPD officers were white, while African Americans accounted for 85% of all frisks. Despite the large uh, scope and widespread use, stop and frisk was not effective on covering anything, weapons, stopping crimes in progress, or saving lives, as Bloomberg argued. In New York, only 6% of these stops resulted in an arrest, and according to NYPD's own data, only 1.75% of stops from 04 to 09 resulted in the discovery of any contraband. That's under 2% of all stops uh, in that six year period uh, resulted in any discovery of contraband and less than 1% sh discovered a weapon and only 0.15% discovered a gun. The police, instead of this imaginary need to, to control a, a rampant group of criminals, the police have instead been central to clearing communities of color for gentrification. They've been key players in the expansion of mass incarceration, which has been a devastating force in black communities for 40 years, incarcerating black people at much higher rates for the same crimes as whites, for policing black communities as occupied territories, and fueling white suburban and rural economies with expanded prison construction. Nearly 100 years of various forms of government-sponsored housing and lending discrimination nationwide have created extreme levels of segregation, underfunded funded segregated Black schools, even in New York today, and maintained high levels of concentrated poverty based on race. The wealth gap, which is roughly 10 to 1 between Whites and Blacks, is the direct result of extensive forms of white affirmative action across an extraordinary range of institutions in housing and education and lending and hiring and so on. And yet nearly every effort to address these extensive and vicious forms of economic, social, psychological suppression have been met with ongoing resistance. And many legal victories from the 1960s and early 70s have been pared down or constrained so much as to render them ineffective. Some of this resistance, of course, can be characterized by a more traditional kind of racial hate. But more often than not, it's a defense of the profitable illusion that the institutions that define our lives function as a meritocracy. And that any adjustment that acknowledges and attempts to address these gross inequities produced by systemic racism would themselves be an act of injustice. 
We see this everywhere in efforts to desegregate schools, in liberal cities, in trying to prove racial discrimination in the workplace, in the resistance to reparations, in trying to free the hundreds of thousands who've been incarcerated for decades for selling small amounts of marijuana in states where it is now legal and where white businesses flourish selling the same substance. We see it too in liberal higher education where efforts to address the systemic practice of what can very easily be called a long-standing legacy of white affirmative action in access to higher education for students, staff, and faculty is met with all kinds of resistance. And yet, we likely agree that Chauvin went too far. And so I want you to, to imagine the importance of, of what we need to do in this moment. Uh, which is that unless we harness this moment as part of a much more comprehensive and profound practice of fighting anti-Black racism, we may miss a crucial opportunity. And so to repeat in closing something I said earlier that I'm hoping is more vivid now uh, later on, relying on such highly visible violent acts and um, as the grounds on which we unite ultimately works to normalize the structures in place all around us structures where the violence and oppression is not one man's knee and suffocation that is not easily capturable in video form. Instead, it is a constant barrage that we need far more than nine minutes to reveal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Tricia. That, that was really, really terrific. And thank you for both uh, explaining the, the architecture behind the series, but also your reflections on recent events to show how the pervasiveness of the systemic racism uh, really actually highlights uh, the rule uh, as opposed to the exception. Uh, can I invite all the panelists uh, uh, to, to join? Um, so we got a number of questions and I uh, some of them are, I thought I would direct to individuals, others maybe to the whole panel um, as a whole for, um, you know, just sort of engage. And while I may be directing questions to individuals, if others want to sort of join in and engage uh, in discourse with, in discussion with one another, that would be great. So let me, let me kick it off uh, with uh, Malik. Um, and um, uh, given that you shared also some of your own personal uh, experiences, the question that came in are, you know, what are your ideas on dealing with being stereotyped in the workforce, dating and making true friendship? What can be done? Well, in some some manners, there is a uh, um, value in uh, <clears throat> building uh, relationships and, and sharing stories and listening to other people's stories that can really uh, uh, deconstruct stereotypes in some people's minds. But at the same time, uh, some of these things are just going to live in people's minds and I'm just going to have to deal with them. And, uh, you know, that is <clears throat> an unfortunate reality. I, I think that there is a uh, just a, a level of, of balancing, trying to figure out, you know, where to build relationships and whose minds I can change and uh, where are some of the places where the, the stereotypes are going to uh, serve interests and, and uh, exist um, beyond anything that I would ever be able to do about it. And that's, you know, frustrating, but probably true. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, let me turn to Ainsley, since you um, invoked uh, Fanon uh, in, in your talk. Uh, we got a question uh, that asked, how can uh, the anti-racism dialogue and discourse in the United States connect with anti-racism movements elsewhere? Um, that's an interesting question. I mean, um, so for me, uh, my, my, uh, my sort of the insights that Fanon gives for thinking about anti-Blackness is that it's a global order, right? White supremacy, anti-racism is a global political order. Um, and that the capacities that were built up in relationship to the Malagasy in Madagascar for someone like Fanon um, are the similar kinds of, of capacities that are born for, from 
customs of um, interracial relating that travel around the globe. And so um, it was really popular to chastise anyone who wanted to talk about blackness um, across region or wanted to talk about race across region. Um, and there was this move or this um, sense that one needed to think about race as a regionally specific entity in order to really understand it. And there is truth to that. There is specificity in, in um, particular regions, um, but that this practice of inequality um, and the ways in which these uh, hierarchical relationships give some people access to shaping and determining the significance and meaning that emerge from our relationships and the world that we share in common, like those, those are the patterns that sort of unite us as a globe. And those are the kinds of patterns and customs that we need to undermine and undo in order to challenge, I think, this immense problem of anti-Black racism. Excellent, thank you, Ainsley. Trisha, you, you were talking about sort of the sort of this moment of you know the attention around the George Floyd, you know, Derek Chauvin uh, trial, but the larger uh, context. And we got a question that said, uh, you know, it feels as though racism is at an all-time high uh, and has been peaked uh, during the pandemic. Why is that? I wonder if you can maybe share, you know, at least that perception that it feels yeah. like it's at an all-time high. Well, you know, I, I don't think it is at an all-time high in, in the sense that that implies a kind of an upward trajectory. Uh, what I think has really happened is that um, social movements coupled with social media have been successful in bringing to the fore uh, a set of consistent ongoing practices that have been you know successfully repressed from the collective imagination mm -hmm. uh, for and, and that that's again part of the way systemic racism works right it's sort of it's a little bit like a magic show you know where you you get a, your, your eye goes to where the the rabbit is and the actual action is over here and that's the action that um, you know, organizers are trying to illuminate, although they're using this extreme moment to try to get us there. And that's, that's again, one of the things I'm concerned about. But I don't think it's an all time high. I mean, if you, you know, if you look at the history of, of the data and the facts about African American life in this country, it's pretty consistent. Um, and you know, uh, <laughs> 1968 is not all that much worse or different than, you know, 1988 or 1998 or 2008, so on and so forth. And, you know, I'm not sure what we want to say about that, but I, I guess what I want to do is illuminate the fact that it is a fairly consistent pattern. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you. Let me go, oh, go back to Ainsley, uh, who, who uh, is uh, trained as a political scientist. Uh, so we got a, a, a question. Uh, saying, considering our African-American history within this country, in particular, the value we put on faith and discipline, why are there not more African-American conservatives? Uh, and on the other side of that coin uh, was the question, how did radical history contribute to the way that Gen Z perceives race today and the way that they deal with it? So two sides of a coin about social movements, ideologies and, and faith this. and how they shape uh, racial politics in America. Okay, that was a lot. I'll try to think, I'll try to take the first question uh, yeah. about why you don't see more black people who are Republican, not conservative, right? So we have that ideological, and I'm actually teaching a class, the black vote, <laughs> that is going to be thinking about some of these issues as well. Um, but when you think about the profile of a black voter, um, there's a there's a research. There's this book called uh, by Phil Pot. That's the last name. Um, conservative, but not Republican. I think that that's the name of the book. Um, where she basically tracks. You know, you see African Americans as an electorate uh, sh uh, showing more conservative views. But the way that the party system works in the United States with the two parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, um, the Republicans are also seen as the party of white folk. And it's actually not in black people's interest to align themselves with the Republican party because the Democrats have, are, are sort of more in line with securing the interest of black people, even though 
black folk are, are, are also captured within the Democratic Party as well. So it, we're in a situation where our political options, our formal political options, actually don't give black folks an opportunity to showcase their um, political diversity, right? Um, and, and you can think about that. I mean, not just think about it. it. That's a feature of a white supremacist sort of racist world that we occupy as well, um, where you where black pol uh, plurality is rendered singular because of um, the the sort of racial politics that are involved in in, in the country. You know, I want to pipe in on that really quickly and add a different dimension. It's a really interesting question. Um, I think what I would uh, add to Ainsley's uh, really interesting point is that um, maybe another reason for this lack of representation among re Blacks, among Republicans, is that the Republican Party claims it's the party of conservatism, but it's really the party of white supremacy that is articulated under the, l the language of conservatism. Right, because you think about all the ways in which it's profoundly liberal around, you know, you know, all kinds of things for certain groups of people. Um, so I guess you know the question is, do we believe the way they understand themselves? And and are African Americans basically saying we hear the dog whistle about what you mean, and therefore we have to get our our conservative values met another way? Yeah, excellent point. Excellent point. Malik, you want to weigh in on that, Malik? I, uh, many of the, the black uh, conservatives that I've, I've come across and, and, you know, from some of the research that I've seen, it's like if, if a person sees a way forward for themselves with a particular ideology, like just for themselves, then maybe they'll adopt it to get ahead. And Republican Party can sometimes offer people options to do that, but at the expense of, endorsing white supremacy that essentially negatively impacts uh, the rest of the black community. So maybe uh, <clears throat> if there were more ways uh, for black folks to, to leverage um, Republican ideals to uh, expand opportunities, which is pretty antithetical to what they're doing, then there would be more people over there, which really is, is, <laughs> which is a, a kind of a different way of, of of uh, uh, saying what, what Tricia was, was just talking about. Absolutely. And then also uh, as a uh, fellow political scientist, you know, how parties have evolved. I mean, how uh, basically the Republican party, once it embraced the Dixiecrats, uh, actually embraced that whole uh, ideology uh, different from uh, what some of parts, some parts of the Republican party uh, had, had believed in uh, beforehand. Uh, let me uh, uh, keep on with you, Malik. Um, there was a really interesting question from someone uh, living in England, uh, and, uh, and this ties to some of your own reflections from school. It says, I'm curious to know what American schools have done to try to end racism. Is anti-racism built into the curriculum? We have not yet cracked it in England, but we've made huge progress. Do you feel that there is progress? What can uh, we I, I feel like there have been instantiations of progress uh, uh, in various places. Uh, I, while I, uh, having grown up in PG County, a place where uh, uh, in Maryland, a place where we have, you know, black school board members and people who are, are able to infuse some ideas into the curriculum. There's a lot of places uh, where I meet people who have just never heard of any, like even just the, the top 40 hits of people from black history. Like they just never heard of Rosa Parks or anything. Like it's just completely erased. And, and we also have instances um, like in Arizona and in uh, um, Los Angeles Unified School District where some ethnic studies and African-American studies uh, ideas have been added to the curriculum uh, uh, cl courses that people can learn and, and, and really pick this stuff up uh, as well as uh, a movement to, to have an African-American studies and African studies um, honors uh, curriculum. And these things can really help, but they are very few and far between. They're hotly contested. Uh, I know in the, the, some of the instances in Arizona, some teachers were actually jailed 
for, for teaching ideas that were critical of, uh, you know, the United States history in these ways that I think are uh, important for the discourse and important for us to collectively have honest conversations about these things that will uh, allow more people to see more humanity in more people. And so this is a political fight as well, hotly contested political fight. So when there are instances of progress, sometimes we also see instances of regression and, uh, and you know, so on and so forth like that. Yeah, excellent, thank you. Let me read another question. This came from uh, one of our colleagues. Um, I'm gonna address it to uh, Trisha. Uh, and the, uh, the questioner uh, basically talks about uh, appreciative, appreciative of uh, the insights from the panelists about the limits of liberal normatives, uh, but has sort of a two-part question. Uh, and I'm addressing this to Tricia because she's been at Brown uh, the longest. Uh, could you speak, first of all, about the connection between anti-Black racism and capitalism? And secondly, what, uh, what does Brown, uh, I don't know if we can talk as an institution, but maybe what are your reflections about uh, the students who protested the visit of Ray Kelly uh, uh, at that point? So let's start with capitalism and anti-Black racism. And then given uh, what's happened in the last uh, eight years, uh, reflections on the Ray Kelly incident. Yeah, sure. Um, um, anti-Black racism is, um, a core and foundational feature of modern capitalism, but it is not dependent on capitalism to exist. So that you can have socialist and Marxist formations that themselves are not uh, um, working against anti-Black racism. There's a long set of debates among many leftists about you know, the degree to which it's a class, that race is itself a class problem, or, you know, race uh, is uh, a racial problem that has a class dimension. So um, capitalism is, has been highly dependent. I mean, really modern capitalism develops, and, you know, I'm, I'm speaking to two political scientists, so I should let you all handle this part, but, you know, you know that, it, that it, it really develops in the context of white supremacy. You can't really understand capitalism just as a free market system, because, of course, it wasn't a free market system for everybody. That's the point, right? It was never, I mean, this is this really amazing tension, right? You have these abstract principles that were never in place, and yet we rely on them as if we've always used them to justify the conditions and the and the circumstances that we're in. So they're separate, um, but they are interdependent uh, in in many ways or interconnected. Um, I um, my reflection on the Ray Kelly incident um, is that um, uh, it was an appalling invitation, in my opinion, because Ray Kelly is not an expert. Ray Kelly was not a, a an academic. He was not a theorist or you know someone who had something to say what I would call an informed opinion about policing. Um, and uh, and I was really disappointed about that. Doesn't mean that I think he shouldn't have been invited. It just means I don't. I personally do not uh, think that he's worthy of that kind of space. Um, and uh, you know I I fully understand why um, universities have to allow for disagreement and therefore events have to be you know allowed to be open but there has to be a real understanding about the climate young students of color are in in particular and that this is this is exactly what i wanted to uh really try to get at around this notion of of liberal racism right where we can say we're just all going to talk we're all just going to listen and we're going to argue carefully and thoughtfully and everyone's in the same situation when the entire structure of the conversation is, is a dehumanizing and, and marginalizing one where the academic and critical skills about race have been marginalized so that students don't have the developed language that they should always because you have X number of courses, X being small, on these issues and therefore they don't, they don't come to it with um, that level of emotional security, nor do they come necessarily with uh, the, the sort of intellectual guns because the curriculum has been has been weak in that regard. Um, so I was disappointed about the whole incident. And, um, you know, I, I so, you know, I mean, th those are just I could be here forever about that. But but that those are my <laughs> those are my off the cuff thoughts about about that incident. 
Well, uh, quite brilliant off the cuff uh, remarks. So thank you, Tricia. That was that was really uh, terrific. Um, let me. Uh, another question came in, and I, I, I thought that this maybe uh, could be uh, great for Ainsley. So there, it's a question that says. It seems we have zero tolerance for domestic violence in families, but zero objection to global violence in the form of American wars against black, brown, and Muslim people of the world. Why don't Americans care enough to stop this injustice? I think that these are big problems, right? Like this is about collectivity. So I don't think that it's a matter of, I mean, certainly, Amer Americans don't care, right? you know, like some Americans don't care. But I think also it's a matter, it's a question of individual agency when we are a part of these large collectives. And I think that this is also signals for us some of the problems with the way that we are currently organized as a polity and the ways in which our individual agency gets lost in um, the way that our, our politics are practiced. Um, so, I mean, and I just think that, yeah, it, it's, and, and how does one sort of activate their agency when you're a part of a collective that, that has existed before you were born, before you ever existed? So the force of that history, of those policies, of those stances in the world, you bear by, you know, you're sort of very coming into the world and, and you have to reckon with, with and deal with. Um, and then what it, the limitations of being one sort of like individual who's a part of a whole. Um, and I think that, I think that this is an important, uh, what it looks like to deal with big problems like the one that the, the question asker named is about being able to more effectively reckon with that dynamic between um, our own personal being in the world and our relationship to others, um, starting from our, our national interest and 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 um and and growing out and, and really thinking about responsibility and accountability in a more robust way um to you know not feel like we're getting lost in these big entities that just determine everything about us and i think that that's a political social problem that we have to deal with and that we have to think about more effectively yeah excellent thank you uh really really great um, let me, this question just came in and uh, I think I'm going to direct it to Malik because it, it touches on some of your own uh, research and it's about, uh, you know, the view of HBCUs uh, where this person teaches uh, and as, you know, um, you know, what, what's your view? Why are they often associated negatively viewed in connotations in the larger academia, uh, academic uh, landscape? Um, and uh, in and in society as, as large uh, at large and and you know so why do we have that perception uh, and then also asking and this is maybe for everyone what kinds of collaborations do we have uh, between Brown and Ivy League institution and uh, faculty colleagues uh, in um, in in HBCU so Malik do you want to uh, Malik do you want to take that yeah, absolutely yeah so. Anti-HBC, well, HBCU uh, stereotyping and anti-HBCU attitudes are uh, longstanding I mean, since the very beginning, since their inception in the 1850s and uh, 1890s with the, the second Moral Land Grant Act. People, uh, uh, white people in the communities where these HBCUs were, um, burned buildings, sabotaged buildings, uh, uh, murdered professors, and so on and so forth. And partly it was the idea that these uh, schools would be educating uh, Black people to compete in the market and compete in society. And that was uh, seen as threatening and frustrating and upsetting. And oftentimes stereotypes serve a particular interest. You know, you, you kind of get behind why, when the stereotype uh, uh, came about and uh, look at the threat moment uh, that happened uh, and, and you get to see, you know, how these, how these things are, are really linked. And there's also just the general perceptions of Black inferiority and the inferiority of Black intellect 
that then is also transferred to spaces that are designed for that particular purpose. And so then they are assumed uh, to be inferior in, in these ways uh, where when people don't have much knowledge about HBCUs, I often meet people who, uh, you know, ask me how many HBCUs there are. Uh, are there like, you know, five or six or something and are surprised to find out that there's over a hundred in a, a, a wide diversity of institutions, often people fill in ambiguity with stereotypes. And that's, uh, you know, how we know this, this process tends to work. So uh, I've also uh, um, studied at an HBCU, uh, people that have inspired me to pursue social psychology and, and many of the ideas that I pursue are, are some of the brilliant minds that I've met at HBCUs that are still a part of my life, still a part of my mentorship uh, group. And they're stellar folks. And many people leave you know, my father was a tenured professor at Cornell. He left to, to, to teach at, at Howard. And uh, you have many people at HBCUs who were uh, trained and, and learned at, 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 you know, all of the institutions <laughs> across the nation, across the globe. And so really people are just, just don't have this knowledge. They don't have this understanding that uh, really the only thing you really get in HBCU is, is a diversity of black people. <laughs> it's, it's, it's diverse, but it's diverse in black with all of the brilliance and all of the innovation that you would expect from, from many other kinds of universities. So that would be uh, my response there. Can Great. I just add one thing? Because I think this is a really important question. I, I just want to add that, you know, we have to just, I mean, Malik just skimmed over this really important point I want to illuminate, which is that, you know, they get established as a way to respond to the forced demand of illiteracy through enslavement and that they become a set of institutions designed to do two things at once <coughs> for black people to educate themselves and to make sure i mean and whites allowed this even as they burned some of the buildings to the ground they generally allowed it so that white institutions could stay white so that white institutions could also stay powerful and centralized so this is a so it's an irony because you want to support hbcus because for all the reasons malik said especially because of the way in which it um, produces a kind of confidence of centrality of black subjectivity. When you're not the only black person in the room, when that's not a subject of the of the learning environment. I mean, the, the freedom that that can produce is really important, the intellectual freedom, the comfort zone. So again, this is what PWIs don't really know how to grapple with, which is the, it's not just that it's filled with white students, it's the racial logic of the fact of white schools that is actually Im impinging on people's capacity to learn. So it's a, so it's a double-edged sword. We wanna support them, but we have to acknowledge that we're, we're in the process of perpetuating a, a structure that is really problematic. Thank you, thank you for adding that. Trisha, this next question I'm gonna to direct to you. Uh, it's a comment, but it has several questions. And it says, uh, I am a DEI advocate at my organization. And in my effort to have open, authentic, safe, and non-judgmental conversations, I've noticed that when we talk about specific groups of brown people, the topic stays on brown people. However, when we speak about just black people, the topic all of a sudden is inclusive of others. The perception is that we speak about blacks and the advancement thereof, all of a sudden, these other, there are other groups are included and it turns out helping all groups and no longer just about black people. Why is it that we, yeah. uh, that, so why is it? Why that, is it that we can't just talk about yeah, black people? Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> how do we steer the conversation black, uh, back to just black people without being perceived as angry? Right, right. This is well, this is definitely a person who's worked in DEI because this is a very nuanced experience based question that I completely um, have experienced myself. So, you know, anti black racism and its formation is not uh, the only form of racism that exists, but one of its hallmarks is the way in which it directly threatens whiteness as the binary. To, that has constructed whiteness in the first place. That binary 
produces a tremendous amount of anxiety about the what blackness does to whiteness, right? So you can have people of color and that multifaceted category does not automatically force a, re a reckoning with whiteness in the same way. It should, in my opinion, but it doesn't. And so uh, there's a fundamental threat and, and a deep level of anxiety that, that the positioning of blackness has produced. I mean, this is what Fanon is also getting at uh, so, so articulately, that fundamental uh, anxiety. So um, there's this sense that if it's for black people or we're talking about blackness, that we have to worry about not upsetting other people. And so that becomes this all lifts all boats philosophy because you can't lift a black vote a boat. You can't lift a black boat and not make whites uncomfortable in the last analysis. That's what I was getting at with the chipping away of all of these efforts, right? That these are liberals chipping away at all of these efforts. And that's why we have to con confront the construction of whiteness. It has to be transformed. Otherwise, this project is going to be very difficult to be successful in. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. So we got a question and it's actually addressed to all the panelists. And it was asked if you could provide insights on how your own lived experiences are echoed in your professional work, your, your field of study, your interactions, uh, uh, et cetera. So how is it that your personal experiences shaped uh, what, uh, if they did, shape the kind of work uh, that you do? And why don't we start uh, with uh, Ainsley? Wow. Um, yes. <laughs> I mean, my personal experiences are very much so central, but in way, I mean, and it's changed over time, you know, like, I guess I'm, you know, probably having a midlife crisis or an existential crisis where I'm thinking about how things have changed for me from when I was, you know, a young and into my, you know, mid to late thirties. And, um, you know, like being in the classroom is an interesting place now for me. Um, you know, I'm, I, I occupy this space of authority, but I'm also a black woman. And the ways in which that experience, like my body and authority are seen as, seen as antithetical to each other. And the ways in which then students and not just white students, right? Students in general reckon with that. And all of the things I have to do as a, someone with authority and holding power in a classroom, how I have to manage that. And oftentimes like how I experience myself as subjugated because of my authority position and because I'm a black woman. Um, and I, it's not just particular to me being a black woman. I think, you know, women, people of color in general deal with this kind of, you know, um, um, situation. And just because I have the language to describe this experience and to know exactly what's going on doesn't mean that I can escape it or leave it as well, because it's not just a, interpersonal problem. It's not just a, you know, like something that I have full agency of, it's the world and the context that we live in that we're gonna bring with us wherever we go and that we all have to grapple with. So yes, um, yeah, that's a big place. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Ainsley. Malik, how about you? Well, going back to, uh, you know, the, one of the stories I opened up with, you know, is the fact that I was uh, told by my high school guidance counselor that I was not college material as well as uh, my father told the same. And we both end up as, you know, PhDs and professors and so on and so forth. There's a, a you know, like a systematic false negative or just a missing of missing of talent uh, in, in black bodies that is, uh, part of what I saw uh, while I was in high school and part of what my, uh, my father saw uh, coming up uh, um, as well. And this idea that, that both uh, um, figuring out what we can do to help support talent that has to go through these uh, uh, insults, that has to go through these uh, uh, particular uh, headwinds to get them to where uh, they ultimately need to be uh, includes, you know, uh, things like uh, mentorship and, um, you know, feedback, support, networks, uh, uh, things of that nature. And I, I came to graduate school really to study the psychology of that, the psychology of network form formation for the purpose of, of helping people to uh, um, 
to accomplish their goals. And we also see other kinds of assessments that uh, produce these sorts of fa false negatives, including standardized tests, uh, as well as uh, things like algorithms that are just systematically missing Black people, Black humanity, Black talent, Black faces, whatever they are, and trying to both problematize that as well as try to build uh, uh, solutions and or awareness and or uh, supports for the people who care enough to try to influence these things is really, you know, the, the, uh, the crux of, of my, my approach to scholarship. So. Great, thank you. Thank you, Malik. Trisha. Well, um, the super short answer is um, I've probably spent, I can't remember not trying to figure this out. Uh, I, I literally cannot remember uh, living uh, in the world without trying to figure out why things were structured the way they were. I was, you know, born in Harlem in the 60s and um, raised primarily in the Bronx in the 70s. Um, and for most of my life, um, I just, you know, wanted to understand how, why things were structured the way they were and um how to figure it out in a way that would empower people. So, you know, culture has always played an important role because so much of this is about people who are marginalized being able to rewrite the story about them in a way that gives them space and a way of seeing the world that empowers them, um, but also allows them to challenge the, the dominant narratives, political, social, and otherwise. Um, it's, there's literally not a moment I can recall where I wasn't trying to connect these things. I will say, I, I remember very distinctly in college, you know, my big first sociology course. And I realized that, that, that these social structures were rendered invisible, which goes back to Malik's uh, response to the curriculum question that I had gone to, you know, eventually I got shipped off out of public school in, in New York City, which in the seventies was in a lot of trouble and went to a very elite private high school. And throughout none of it did I learn anything about Black people, really, that I didn't just read on my own. Um, maybe a couple of things here. I think I read, you know, Man, Child in the Promised Land because the librarian recommended it to me. So it just goes to show you how crazy that was. But um, you know, like no, no Du Bois, no nothing else, just Man, Child in the Promised Land. So people in the audience probably know who that is. Anyway, so, um, so what, what ultimately happens in college is, you know, inequality, the structures of inequality when made visible gave me this incredible toolkit to start making sense of it. So I remember that transition very vividly as being very empowering, but also devastating because I was like, wow, this is not random. <laughs> this is pretty well organized. Um, but, um, but yeah, for me, my work has very much always been about um, you know, trying to connect those experiences, not only of myself, but of people around me. Um, to, to the ideas and to, to create more space and more possibility. Great. I have one question that I'm gonna ask uh, for all of you that it, it's sort of an amalgam of different questions that have come in, uh, uh, basically uh, asking, you know, what can white allies do? How can white allies uh, not contribute to the dominant narrative, not contribute to white, uh, pr pr uh, uh, white supremacy? but how to do it in a way that doesn't put pressure on black friends, colleagues, community to necessarily take on the extra work of the role of educator, et cetera. And I wonder if any of you have suggestions for that. I do. So I actually, I wanna give a plug for an amazing book that I've had an opportunity to read lately by a colleague Black aliveness and um, the ways in which the, the, the account of oneness and study. So like the question, the preceding question that was asked of us about like how our own personal experiences have influenced our own, you know, thinking and studying. I would invite one, and, and I think this is an alternative to consciousness raising per se, right? I would invite people to study their experiences in the world, like become like the way that Trisha put, like I always wanted to understand why things work the way that it did, right? And I, I remember being oriented or being animated by that same kind of question because of the kinds of frictions that arised in my own life 
And I think that one of the things that anybody can do to be a more ethical presence in the world is to really use their lives as a touch point of study, right? Like use your experiences and how you operate in the world and the kind of dissonance that you feel in this like horribly illusory messed up world that we currently occupy and use that as a space to think and try to understand better why things are happening the way that they are. And I think that, you know, starting from that kind of place of reflection and thoughtfulness and thinking can open, can reveal to you other way, like your relationships with other and how you can be a more effective, responsible, ethical, good person in the world. And, and it's that kind of, you know, I think that that's an important first step. Yeah. yeah. Or a step, not first. You want to add to that? Anyone? Yeah, I would think also about the kinds of places where people have agency. Uh, if you are in a workspace, if you are voting for school board, if you, uh, you know, you're at the bookstore or, or what have you, really just lean into it, learn as much as you can, read as much as you can, and then don't just sit on it and keep it, but use it to push back out against uh, uh, what is out here in the world. And so if, if the school curriculum, you know, in your local town or something is not doing, is not talking about this, then put some pressure on them. Use the capital that you have, go put pressure on them. If, if hiring practices at work seem to keep producing the same people over and over and over, speak up about it, uh, educate yourself about it, and put pressure on folks to expand opportunities. Uh, uh, mentor, uh, 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 you know, uh, find ways to, to support and uh, expand opportunities for, for, for folks because, you know, if, if you, <laughs> like, putting evenness or, or putting a, a, a status quo on top of inequality just keeps reproducing the inequality that already exists. So it's just actively fight against it, throw your life force at it. And because yeah. some of us don't have the opportunity to not do that. Right, right. I mean, the, the one thing I would add uh, is, um, is to be a relentless interrogator of whiteness. You know, whiteness works by being invisible, by pretending it just doesn't exist. It wanders through the world with an enormous level of innocence and freedom. Uh, Baldwin has written so eloquently about this, about the innocence of America, right? Which is, he doesn't mean it literally. He means it imagines itself to be innocent. And that innocence inures it to all kinds of critique. So it's sort of a, always in a state of shock, always, what, what could this be? So the first move to me is to really be a critical interrogator of whiteness and understand how it constructs language and uses of, of uh, minimization of racism and um, you know, white fragility and any number of other things, uh, as well as all these structures of opportunity that, um, that uh, even for people who are not well off, who are white, they have, would in fact be poorer were they not. So really getting at those distinctions requires interrogating this deep invisibility. And I will just give a warning that if you do it well, you'll be pissed off for a while because it's the realization that you've been lied to. I mean, again, I, I had that moment too, and I continue to have it for different reasons, but, but that realization of the level of lie that's been told is devastating, but it is also the, the thing that allows for the proper kind of engagement. The what can I do relies on that moment because once you can see it, you can never unsee it. And now you, you're not just an ally, you're, you are changing the framework that you need to be an ally with, right? You're actually changing the very structure of, 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 of the environment. So that, that to me would be step, that's the first step, well, an early step to, to use the same modifier that Ainsley just said, not the first step, but a first step um, that, that I would recommend. Oh, thank you. Thank you all for that. I mean, I think this idea of interrogating one's own experience, interrogating uh, the big lie uh, of, you know, the, you know, just assumes that whiteness is the, uh, the, 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 the norm and, and how it's uh, shaped and also uh, using one's uh, position uh, to try to do something about it. These are all uh, really, really uh, uh, useful and um, 
uh, pieces of advice. Uh, we're unfortunately coming to the end of our time. Uh, I just want to just say how incredibly wonderful this conversation has been. Uh, a wonderful capstone, as Tricia uh, used that word, uh, to the whole series. I think having more of these conversations, learning from one another, being able to share uh, these experiences and then do something about it, which I uh, certainly hope to use my positionality to uh, uh, to, to do that uh, is uh, has, has really been amazing. So thank you all for uh, really wonderful uh, presentations. I also want to uh, thank uh, everyone who made this whole series as well as this session uh, possible. Of course, uh, Tricia Rose and her colleagues at CSREA for conceptualizing uh, the series and, and really so thoughtfully constructing it over the course uh, of a year and being so careful about curating each of the sessions and uh, inviting terrific uh, panelists uh, to media uh, services uh, and university events. Macon Silvestri has been uh, terrific uh, uh, for, to uh, Marissa Quinn, uh, the chief of staff in our office, who's just been incredible with this. And, uh, and to everyone uh, here today for um, participating in this really uh, wonderful uh, event. Terrific questions. I'm sorry that we only got to some of them, uh, but as you can see in the chats, there are many other follow-on events. There'll be continuing uh, programming in this uh, vein because uh, that's what we need to be doing and that's part of our mission at Brown. So let's keep this conversation going. So thank you everyone, please stay safe. Uh, and uh, and be well. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.